Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I decided to talk about constructive mathematics from the point of view of an ordinary mathematician. So somebody who is primarily not interested so much in philosophy and logic, but just wants to do math. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what it's like to work in constructive mathematics and um, which aspects of it are relevant to mathematics in general. So I hope you're at least a little bit curious about this topic. I also apologize in advance for not being able to hide my positive feelings about constructive mathematics. <laughs> but feel free to interpret me and ask questions, except if you are a seasoned constructivist and you want to make a fine point about meta-mathematics. This talk, I would like to keep it at the level of math, not at the level of logic or philosophy. Um, so somebody asked me whether this is like nine circles. Um, it's five stages of the psychologist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who identified the stages of accepting death. And these are <laughs> denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So not everyone goes through all these stages, and they don't necessarily come in this order, but they can be applied to many other situations, such as learning. Uh, but before we get into psychology, I do want to review a little bit about the law of excluded middle. So the law of excluded middle, or just LEM as an acronym, is what this talk is about. It's about how to not use it. So what does it say? It says, for all propositions P, P holds or P doesn't hold. Now, this is extremely self-evident to any mathematician who is trained in the, standard in the standard school. So it is very, very hard not to believe in the law of excluded middle. And so abstaining from it can create quite a bit of an anxiety. But we're going to talk about that when we get to depression. So first, <laughs> we want to, um, first, we want, first I want to say a couple of things just about the law of excluded middle. There is an equivalent form of the law excluded middle, which is called proof by contradiction, or double negation law, which says for every p in prop, not not p implies p. Now, I'm mentioning this not because it's really relevant for my talk, but because mathematicians call two things proof by contradiction and they are really different. They are not at all the same. And so the first one is this, proof by contradiction. The second one, and how do we use proof by contradiction in a proof? So in a proof, we write something like this. We say, we say suppose P were false. Then blah, 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 contradiction. Hence, P holds. That's how a proof by contradiction, well, that's what the proof by contradiction looks like. You want to prove P. You say, suppose it's false, blah, 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 blah. Contradiction, ah, P is true. And the second one, which they also call proof by contradiction, goes like this. Suppose P were true. Then, Blah, 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 contradiction. Hence, not P. This is not the same. This is equivalent to the law of excluded middle, but this is just how you prove negation. This one is constructively valid. It is a law which is constructively valid. I'm saying this because I have met mathematicians who think that in constructive mathematics, the word contradiction is prohibited. As soon as you say contradiction, you're classical. That's not the case. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. So if you're trying to prove a proposition by assuming that it is false, then that's excluded middle or proved by contradiction. But if you're trying to prove a negation, that's how you prove a negation. You assume P and you get a contradiction. So this one is perfectly OK. That's just something I wanted to um, clear up. So another thing that you might think is that because in constructive mathematics we do not accept the law of exclu excluded middle, we deny it. 
This is not the case. Constructive mathematics is, keeps silent about the law of extrusive middle. We do not accept it. We do not deny it. We just don't use it. Okay? So, particular cases of law of excluded middle might be okay, but you have to establish them first. Okay? There are, vi there are variants of classical mathematics, of constructive mathematics, when, where the law of excluded middle is actually false. But those are special cases. Those are special sub branches. So, you know, when people say constructive mathematics, Bishop, there's an old joke that says, that when Bishop um, worked out his constructive analysis, he missed the name. He should have said ecumenical, not constructive. So, um, how might one imagine that the law of excluded middle is false? I was there. I was in grad school. <coughs> I had to get over this somehow. So the thing that helped me most, sort of as a mental crutch, <coughs> was to imagine the following. Whenever you prove a disjunction, when you make the decision, it has to be done continuously or computably, whichever you prefer. So if you're more of a computer scientist, think it has to be a decision procedure, which tells you this or that. If you are more of a topologist or a geometer, then think, ah, the decision we're making has to be continuous. So it has to be stable under small perturbations and so on. So, for example, under this reading, let's consider as an exercise um, this statement. For all x in R, x is less than 0 or x is greater than 0. Now, for this to be the case, under this topological reading, it would give us a map from R to 0, 1, which tells us whether this or that possibility holds. And this map would have to be continuous. Just assume standard topologies in all spaces here. But there is no such map. You can't make this choice continuously because you break apart the reals. So this is not going to be OK constructively. On the other hand, if you have a statement like every natural number is less than, than, less than 7 or greater than 2 equal to 7, that's OK. That's both OK from the computational point of view but also from a topological point of view because the natural numbers have a discrete topology on them. So this also means that if I define this set, then since I cannot accept this, it's going to be a proper subset of the reals. Now, this is also really, really weird, OK? Because you will say, this is totally crazy. There is no number which is somehow magically neither negative nor non-negative. Aha. But by that, the statement I just made, what is it? The statement I just made says, R without S is empty. There is no number here which isn't also there. But this is not the same as that. You need excluded middle to go from one to the other. So this is a different statement. So a better way to imagine how these two sets could be different is to think that every set in constructive mathematics is more like a space. It's got some hidden structure, either computable structure or topological structure. There's something floating around. And it's this structure that may change as well as the points. So S and R have the same points but different structure, different topology, so to speak, although it's not exactly topology. So if you are a computer scientist, think of it this way. These are reals, whatever their representation is. These are like reals with an extra bit of information telling you whether this or that holds. So it's the structure that's different. It's the encoding, the information provided in the, type, in the set, not the points themselves. OK. So um, as a first, ex uh, I'm, going to do, I'm going to do one proof carefully, just to, so that you see how, what, what happens. If we're going to give up the law of excluded middle, we have to give up the axiom of choice. And that is because there is a theorem by Diaconescu, which says the axiom of choice 
implies the law of excluded middle. So I want to do this proof, and I want to do it slowly, just so you see once where you have to pay attention. OK, so how does the proof go? It's a pretty proof. So where would you look for this? So whenever you hear axiom of choice, you're thinking, ah, oh, large sets, large families of sets, large products, trouble, trouble. In constructive mathematics, the trouble is at your feet. There are all these critters, you know, they're climbing up your legs, and they're like awful. So the trouble is going always to happen with nice little finite sets. That's where the constructive trouble is. So here we go. I'm going to use a family which has kind of two sets in it. So first of all, let's define. There is no surprise in defining natural numbers or defining a set like this, because you just say, these are all the x's which are either 0 or 1. And then you define two sets. Oh, so now you say, take any p in prop. We're now supposed to decide p. We have to tell whether p holds or not p holds. OK? So Diaconescu says, consider these two sets. I'm going to take x in 2 such that x is 0 or p. And the other set is y in 2 such that y is 1 or p. This is a typical trick. You stick in some p, which doesn't really depend on x. But you pretend, so for, for, for a moment, think, I have a truth value, but I didn't tell you which one it is. Okay? And so I define these two sets. And now I claim. claim that the family of sets A, B is a family of inhabited sets. So that, so that I can apply choice to it. OK, so is a family of inhabited sets. Inhabited is just a fancy way of saying they have something in them. OK, consider any element of this set. By definition, it is either A or B. If it is A, then it contains 0. If it is B, then it contains 1. Therefore, every set in this family has an element. OK, therefore, by the axiom of choice, I can get the choice function. F, which maps from A, B to 0, 1. And now, because equality on natural numbers is decidable, which is something that you can prove by induction on the natural numbers, I can consider cases. So let us see what are some cases here. Yes? Yes. It's by definition, if you're doing set theory, no, 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 no. this. Yeah, this, OK, so it's, it's x in set such that x is A or x is B. It's just you get it from the pairing axiom for set theory. So this, oh, this, uh, it's a family of sets It's a set that I want to apply the axiom of choice to. So I need a family of non-empty sets. And this is my family. So it's a family of all characterized by 0, 1. Um, no, it's a set of sets. OK, yeah, so better it's safer to say it's a set of sets for just doing, I'm just going to do straight set theory here. So it's a set of sets. Each element of this set of sets is inhabited. Therefore, I may apply the axiom of choice. OK, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, when you have a set of sets, you can always parameterize it over itself. So uh, yeah, so now we have some, we have our choice function. And I can consider some cases. So what are the cases? Well, the choice function maps A and B. And because these are number 0 or 1, there are two cases to consider. Or actually, I think I can make it into 3. Uh, I mean 4, but I can make it into 3. If, if, if we have chosen 0 from both sets, well, if we have chosen 0 from both sets, that means 0 is in B.
Uh, the choice function is going to map into A union B, but A union B is 0, 1. OK? Yes? Zero is in zero is in the union, one is in the union, okay. and uh, that's already all that it can be because it's all of two. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And if you don't think that it's all the whole thing, I can still embed a union b into 0, 1 and just prolong this function by the inclusion. OK, so if they both get 0, that means f chose 0 from b. But if 0 is in b, then by if we look at how b is defined, you get 0 equals 1 or p. But this is false. False or p is p, so p. And then similarly, if you have 1, you're going to have 1 and a here. And you're going to get p. So this is the second case, which is symmetric. And then the third case is if f of a is different from f of b. Aha, but if f of a is different from f of b, then a is different from b. But if a is different from b, then p cannot hold. For if p holds, then a and b are the same and both equal to 2. Therefore, p does not hold. So in all cases, we have decided that in these two cases, p holds, and in this case, p doesn't hold. OK? That's a typical little proof where you dance a little dance around the law of excluded middle. Um, OK. Yes. Yes, OK, so let's see. How do we know? That these cases cover everything? Are you not including the last two groups? Yes. OK. So um, I'm going to consider, so I'm going to say, I'm going to observe that f of a is a natural number, which is either 0 or 1, and f of b is a natural number, which is either 0 or 1. I'm entitled to say that every element of 2 is either 0 or 1, because that's how 2 is defined. It says it's those things which are either 0 or 1. Just by definition, it is like that. OK? So. This one, being an element of 2, is either 0 or 1. So I have two cases. And they cover everything. And then I have two further cases as to whether f of b is 0 or f of b is 1. And similarly here. So I get four cases, but I contracted two of them together. OK? Seems to be OK. Seems to be okay. okay. <laughs> if you don't believe me, you can just type it into cock. Yes, something like that. OK, so let's do some, after this initial exercise, let's do some psychology, OK? What was the first stage? It was denial. OK, so I'm pretty much sure that everybody is in some sort of denial here. Most, well, many people here are in some sort of denial. And I'm pretty sure I can get everybody up to anger today. So <laughs> then after that, it gets harder. It takes time. So um, constructive mathematics, broadly speaking, is mathematics without the law of excluded middle. And so um, here is what David Hilbert had to say about this, uh, if we are to believe the internet, by the way. So <laughs> taking the principle of excluded middle from the mathematician would be the same, say, as proscribing the telescope to the astronomer or to the boxer the use of his fists. To prohibit existence statements and the principle of excluded middle is tantamount to relinquishing the science of mathematics altogether. So he's saying, constructive mathematics, no. It's not going to work. That's denial. <laughs> Interestingly enough, if Hilbert and Brouwer agreed on something, it was that when the law of excluded middle goes, a lot of mathematics goes. But it was then Eric Bishop, much later, who showed that this is not the case and people who worked after him and we know nowadays that this is absolutely not the case. It is not the case that standard mathematics is going to disappear once we abolish the law of excluded middle. It's different. Some would say it's better, but it's still there. OK. 
However, it is still very easy to mount an attack against constructive mathematics. So here are some things that you cannot prove without the law of excluded middle or choice. Every mathematician knows a lot of things that cannot be proved without choice, and we just saw that choice is out of the game as well. So in algebra, we have, for example, every ideal is contained in a maximal ideal, or every vector space has a base. And then there's some trouble. You have to be very careful about the fundamental theorem of algebra if you don't have choice. In analysis and topology, um, sorry, not choice, excluded middle. In, in analysis and topology, uh, if you want to show that the closed interval 0, 1 is compact, you typically use excluded middle. The intermediate value theorem is also something that's going to be hard to do without excluded middle. The Honov theorem, the product of compact spaces is compact, is a well-known equivalent to the axiom of choice. All of this flies out of the window. Well, that's a good attack on constructive mathematics. Um, set theory, let's just take something simple. Ordinals, ordinals are linearly ordered. Seems reasonable. Or something really, really, something that you would really expect to hold. Like, there is no embedding of real numbers into the natural numbers. Can't do it without excluded middle. Or at least when you try, you don't see how to do it. So, and by cover it one is uh, the fact that uh, uh, every uh, polynomial with coefficients in the field has a factorization into irreducible polynomials. So, factorization of polynomials into irreducible ones. With coefficients in the field. In, oh, in a field, yes, yeah. yes. Yes, algebra all becomes really suspicious yeah. when you try to do it without. And, and I think Yes, yeah, I think you, you, it's a very nice example of denial here. Yes. The trouble you will get into it at some point, you will get to a, an element of the field, and you will have to decide whether it's zero. And then you will say, oh my god, I wish I had excluded middle. No, but even if the field has a decision for it. Ah, even so, OK. You don't have that in, uh, yeah. OK, so it's a really bad one. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You may have a real, yeah. so, really good field right. where the equality can be defined, mm -hmm. but you cannot prove that uh, every polynomial is a product of irreducible. <laughs> okay, no, but, uh, oh, I can do better than that. Anger. You want anger? <laughs> anger. Okay. So. Yes? Can you still prove that every uh, integer is a product of prime integers? Yes. Okay. Yes. Constructive. Yeah, anything, anything done, and any, anything done by ancient Greece is constructive, right? <laughs> I think. That's like a vague measure of what's going on. <laughs> so, um, so you're only saying this to academics? <laughs> so, I'm building on the anger here. OK. So to get you really angry, not only will I tell you that certain theorems cannot be proved anymore, but that there are varieties, there are situations, that is to say models of constructive mathematics, where really bizarre things are permitted. OK? So here are some of the bizarre things that are permitted. In constructive mathematics, it is consistent to have a result, results like the following. Not all subsets of a finite set are finite. OK, here's another one. There is a set which is neither finite nor infinite. Here's another one. Ordinals form a set. Here's another one. There is an injective map from the reals into the natural numbers. OK, so this is totally bizarre. OK, analysis. Uh, you can set things up so that the real numbers have measure zero, or you can get an infinite cover of the closed interval without the finite subcover, or you can get an unbounded continuous map on the closed interval. Okay. Algebra. <laughs> if you're not careful how you do things, the integers do not form a principal ideal domain. Okay, that's weird. So, feel the anger. It will make you powerful. 
<laughs> draw, okay, so let's, let's do other things. So, okay, but, so we have to work on this business. We have to somehow get through the anger, okay? So I'm going to tell you about some good things that can happen. There are also good things that can happen. So you can set up the constructive mathematics is much more permissible in the kinds of axioms that it thinks are okay. It does not prohibit axioms, which are, from a classical point of view, totally ridiculous. So some of them are axioms which are okay are things like all functions are computable. Or all functions are continuous. This was Brouwer's favorite. All functions are continuous. Um, you can make a very general theory where anything inside it looks continuous. So it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be everywhere defined. Um, so one, over one over x is continuous on its domain, on, on where it is defined. Yeah. yeah, you have to be careful how you define continuity of partial functions, of course. Yes. <laughs> yes. If, if it's true, the same yes. 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 Or you can even say all functions are smooth. I'm skipping over a lot of s details here exactly how this works, but these are possibilities. These are possibilities. I don't believe the last one. It's not you have to, it's not going to be the usual that I can realize that the functions are smooth on, but it's it's something called synthetic differential geometry and in that context it's okay. So, um, here's another one, every set comes equipped with a topology. Are you working on the resignation or the anger? <laughs> this is, this is the, I'm, I'm, I'm going towards bargaining now. I will make you bargain for something, okay? So, is this good? Well, if you're a computer scientist, of course it's good. This one is good, okay? Now, if you're a topologist, wouldn't it be nice if you never ever had to define a topology or prove that any map is continuous. You're thinking that's gonna put me out of my work. No, you get to define whatever sets you like, they already have the topology. You construct the reals, lo and behold, the Euclidean topology crops up without your defining anything at all. Or you define a map, as soon as you define it, it's continuous, you're done. Nothing to worry about, okay. So um, this one, the smooth, the smooth guys, okay? This is where, this is what physicists keep doing, right? So officially, <laughs> officially, they live in a dream world, right? Officially, they're supposed to use epsilon and deltas. And you walk into the physics, you walk into the physics major class, you teach them analysis, epsilon, deltas. They go to a physics class, from your math class, they walk to something like mechanics, infinitesimals everywhere, just differentiate. And you ask them, Excuse me, why can you differentiate this? And they say, oh, I just assume I can differentiate. Or I assume whatever I need to differentiate. So that's like saying I differentiate. And so they have not, physicists have actually not really left the constructive mathematics of the 17th century. They still do their analysis like Leibniz and Newton, let's be honest. So I have physicists on my side. Computer <laughs> scientists are naturally gravitating towards constructive mathematics anyway. And that should get you a little bit worried. And so you should be saying, ah, but there must be a way to save the situation. So how do we save the situation? Well, I have spoken about models. I said, there is a model in which, you know, you can, you can build these models and then everything is continuous in the model or everything is computable in the model and so on. So that sounds like a good plan. What we're going to do is, we can't, you don't have to give up classical mathematics. Instead, if anybody wants to do constructive mathematics, they're welcome to build their own model and do it in the privacy of their model and we don't want to know what they're doing, okay? So that sounds like a good deal. Now, there is a problem, you see, whereas, Set theorists, classical set theorists, they build models, they do forcing, and you can kind of ignore them, right? Like, <laughs> they have their models, what's it to me, right? The trouble with the models in constructive mathematics is you can't really ignore them. 
they are very, very, very important. They're called things like Grotendieck toposes. You can't ignore Grotendieck toposes. If you're going to do sheaves, that is a model of constructive mathematics. So that's the first trouble. The models are suspiciously natural. Okay, so that's not good. Um, moreover, constructive mathematics spills over into classical mathematics in these models. So let me show you one theorem like that. So I'm now working towards your thinking, God, this stuff might be useful. So let's see. Here's a theorem by Alex Simpson and myself. And um, you can remember it as continuity begets continuity. Working in classical set theory. Suppose some function f, these are uh, just to make things simple, say these are functions on complete separable metric spaces, okay? Just to make things simple. Suppose f is defined from continuous functions g1 to gn using only constructive arguments. Um, so for, com for, for uh, preserve, preserve limits of sequences, for example, that's a good one. It, technically speaking, this one here works for sequentially continuous. So classically, on complete separable matrix spaces, there's going to be only one notion of pointwise continuity. Uh, but for technical reasons, it's sequential continuity. Preserves limits of convergent sequences is the one that I need for this. Okay, so what's the conclusion? The conclusion is F is continuous. Now, the proof goes through these pesky models, okay? So what the proof does is you build a suitable topos of sheaves and you reinterpret your construction, which you may because it is constructive and the topos is a model of constructive mathematics. You reinterpret it so that you see that you could have defined this F from these Gs in that topos. But this topos is made so that in it, all functions are continuous. So now you need a little bit, of, little bit of back and forth to figure out that continuous in the topos is the same as continuous in classical set theory, usual logic theory stuff. But you get through it and you transfer the construction from that model back to the classical mathematics. And so there is a spillover there. And so then you say, oh, okay, that's kind of interesting. So maybe it's nice to pay attention to how I construct things because sometimes they can be, they can be continuous for free. This is a form of reflection. We <coughs> reflect on the form of the expression. Uh, one that you are used to is you look at some expression and you say, oh, without this is obviously a differentiable function. And you can tell that because it's written down so that's obviously differentiable. Another one which is maybe a little less obvious is that you, uh, if I have a set which is defined from open sets using only conjunction, disjunction, and existentials, it's still open. That's because intersections, finite intersections, finite unions, and arbitrary unions of opens are open. So that's, that's a form of reflection. Here, this is a fancier kind of reflection. You have to investigate the whole proof, not just some small bit, not just some expression. The proof becomes relevant. Oh, I'm so glad I got that in. Okay. So. So it's cool stuff, right? You want to get depressed? We can get depressed. Okay. So depression is the next one. You know, I really believe that like half of you are still here, but let's go on. <laughs> so, um, so suppose you say, okay, fine. Constructive mathematics is cool. I'm too old for this. <laughs> it's too late. 
OK, so my first response is that um, some mathematicians are like too old to get a second Fields Medal, but that doesn't prevent them from jumping headlong into constructive mathematics. So that's not a good argument. <laughs> so in fact, the anxiety, you see, when you try to do these things, the anxiety that you experience from abstention from the law of excluded middle, it's not really that bad. You can get used to it, and then eventually it goes away. So um, the good news is that a typical uh, piece of classical mathematics is mostly constructive anyway. Right? That's important. It's mostly constructive. If you try to write your proofs in the most beautiful way that you know how to, you are going to produce things which are almost always constructive. And so, for example, have you ever heard a category theorist say, oh, I want to prove that this diagram commutes. Let's suppose it doesn't. <laughs> right? <laughs> or, I mean, this is all over the place, right? So have you ever heard the physicist who wanted to solve a differential equation say, let's assume there is no solution? <laughs> or a computer scientist who wants to find an algorithm and say, let's suppose this is not computable. It's in the nature of certain kinds of mathematics that they want to be constructive, and that's how people think of them. So it's not that bad. In any case, you can play it safe. You don't have to do it. You find a bright young mind. And then you make him do constructive mathematics, and you see what happens. Actually, I did this right, to somebody, and he's sitting in the audience. <laughs> okay? And there are a couple of others here with the Univalent Foundations. And we performed this experiment. The experiment, it failed badly. We made sure that these people, some of them, they, don't, that they haven't even started their PhDs yet, you know, just to be on the safe side. However, and we made sure they didn't have any training in homotopy theory. However, in the span of a half an academic year, they have produced a staggering amount of homotopy theory in a constructive setting, and they formalized it all twice. So now you may feel depressed. <laughs> so this brings me to the last stage, which is acceptance. too late for us, but what will all these young people do? So let me see, where am I? I am here. OK, so I'm now going to do a little bit more math. What does it once, so let's ask truly, what does constructive mathematics look like? Can we really fix all the problems that we mentioned earlier? What do we do about all those horrible theorems, which are obviously totally crazy? What do we do about them? So we can't fix everything, but we can fix a lot. Mathematics is still around. So I will just demonstrate this on a very well-known theorem that everybody can think about easily, the intermediate value theorem. This is going to be a typical move. So the intermediate value theorem says, suppose you have f on the interval 0, 1 to r, such that f of 0 is below 0 and f of 1 is above 1. Then there exists an x such that f of x is 0. That's the classical one. Did I say continuous? Continuous. Continuous. It has to be, of course, a continuous map. OK? Doesn't work constructively. In fact, in the effective topos, you can see that this is false. But often, theorems that are classically correct need to be relaxed a little bit, or additional assumptions have to be built in, so that then they go through. This particular one can be fixed in many ways, and I'm just going to show you two. So the first version which works constructively is this. Under the same assumptions, f from 0, 1, continuous, negative here, and positive there. For every epsilon greater than 0, there is an approximate 0.
if you're a numerical analyst, you say, of course, that's, that's what we have been doing all our lives with numerical methods. All numerical methods work like this. You can't do bisection. You have to stop at finite precision. Otherwise, you're asking for a lot of trouble called numerical instability. So this makes a lot of sense to a numerical analyst. This is the sort of theorem we can compute. And often, it's actually enough. But we can do also the other versions. So here's one. Suppose f is like before. And in addition, all roots of f are isolated. That is to say, if I have a root, if I have a 0, then there is a small interval around it where that's the only 0. Then, then f actually has a 0. And this is in, these two are easy to prove. So for this one, instead of doing bisection, you do trisection. Uh, sorry, this one you just do bisection. This one you do, you do a kind of bisection where you have to be careful. If you think you're around the root, then you use the fact it's isolated, you go away from it, and so on. And so that's slightly more involved, but it works just as well. If you, it, it, it immediately, the proof immediately tells you what, what, what numerical method you have invented when you do that sort of thing. This is a typical situation. You can fix things like that. I'm not saying you're going to fix all problems, but you're going to fix a lot of problems. OK, what about the set theoretic abominations? I said earlier, there is a subset of a finite set which is not finite. That's crazy. There are, oh, another one which is nice is there are countably many countable subsets of natural numbers. So let's think about this. Isn't every subset of natural numbers countable? So I'm saying there are countably many subsets of natural numbers. So that's going directly against Cantor's theorem, which, by the way, holds constructively. Ah. Not every subset of natural numbers need be countable. So there are strange theorems like that. But when you interpret them in the effective topos, where everything is computable, they become standard theorems in computability theory. You can see that they are just the set theoretic, the internal way of expressing facts about computability theory. So let me just mention one. There is a set which is neither finite nor infinite. That's called an immune set in computability theory. There is such a notion in computability theory called immune sets. And there you say it with computable functions and sequences and how something doesn't happen. Once you do this in constructive mathematics, it can be seen in this simple crystallized form. There is a set which is neither finite nor infinite. Yes, it's a strange kind of mathematics. But it's mathematics that was invented before in a different guys, right? So um, to conclude, I would like to also speak about the issue of maximal ideals, because that sounds like a serious real trouble. Constructively, you can't show that they have sufficiently many maximal ideals. So what's wrong with that? Well, the trouble is that this destroys the duality between algebra and geometry. There is a deep duality by, uh, between algebra and geometry started by Marshall Stone. It's Stone duality. And the general idea is, let's say, if we take um, a commutative ring with unit, the general thing that you do is you say, to every algebraic structure, there is a dual space called the spectrum. And the points of the spectrum are the maximal ideals. How am I supposed to recover this duality which is definitely something I don't want to give up because it's too beautiful and too important. How will I recover it if I don't have the points from which to build the space? And so here we see that sometimes if you're taking constructive mathematics seriously, it will force you to rethink basic notions. What is a space? You will be forced to say, ah, all my life I was completely mistaken about what a space is. Because, let's be honest, why does a space have to have any points? So there are no points for the spectrum? Fine, but you still know what the topology is. How is the spectrum made? 
the points are the maximal ideals. The topology is generated by the elements of the ring, which, depending on how you turn things around, are seen either as basic opens or basic closed. So we know what the topology is. We just don't have the points. So what? Let's get over it. So this leads to an idea of a space where you don't start by saying a space is a bag of points which we are about to glue together in some way. We are going to describe spaces by, their, by a different kind of structure. Namely, we're going to go directly for the topology. And then the points, the ideal elements that even David Hilbert was afraid of, they will be just ghosts. Maybe they're there, maybe they're not. Again, I'm not saying that I'm going to solve every problem in uh, duality this way. I'm just saying it's a possibility worth exploring. So then you get to a theory of spaces without points. It's called local theory or formal topology. It works beautifully. It shows that there are unseen connections between computer science, topology, and logic. And uh, so I invite you to look into this. So for example, you learn that there is a dual notion to compactness. You know, people like dual notions. So a dual notion to finite is infinite, you would say. Okay? So a dual notion to compactness is, uh, not clear, overtness. You have never heard of overtness. And you have never heard of overtness because in classical topology, every space is overt. So this is something you've been using all your life, but you never paid attention to it because it's totally invisible because it's everywhere. Okay? So you get, you get distinctions that were not there before. And I think to a mathematician, rather than saying this is scary, it should be this is fascinating. Let's explore this. This is where I'm expressing positive feelings about okay, constructive mathematics. So um, at the end, you can ask, well, OK, this is all very well. But can this stuff also be useful in classical mathematics? Why do I have to do constructive mathematics? Yes. Let me give you two examples. One is, if you think of spaces as locales, that is to say, as spaces which don't necessarily consist of points, but you just describe their topologies, then you can have spaces without points. Here's an example. This was worked out by Alex Simpson very beautifully. Um, what is a random real? Well, a random real is a randomly chosen real. So it's not any particular real. It's not pi, for example, right? It's not square root 2. Uh, we could define random reals as those reals which satisfy all almost sure properties. That is to say, let's take the closed interval, intersect all open sets of measure 1. Whatever is left in there, those are the random reals. But there are no such reals because I can exclude every real. I have this real. I take the open set, which is everything but the real. It's going to be in the intersection. I have excluded it. So I'll get the empty set. No. I will get a space which doesn't have any points, but has a lot of nice structure. And it's exactly the one that confirms the naive expectations of what a random real is. And this works classically. Another thing which is also, which this was also suggested and worked out by Alex Simpson, is that once you pass to this new notion of space, which works well constructively, and you use it in classical set theory with choice, the banach tarski paradox, which is kind of like a skeleton in the closet for the classical mathematicians, disappears. It's not there anymore. If you think of spaces as locales, the banach tarski paradox goes away. It can go, yeah. Um, but you get to keep the choice this way. So I get to keep choice, but change what a space is. Okay. Another one, with the new kind of spaces, you can prove the Honov theorem, the product of compact spaces is pro compact. You can prove it constructively, no choice, no excluded middle, nothing hold. It just holds. Okay. So there are benefits. And so what I'm saying to conclude is, what I'm saying is that Constructive mathematics, even if you are not so much interested in doing bizarre things like, you know, this, okay? There are concepts which are coming from it, which are worth paying attention to, even if you're just a classical mathematician. Constructive mathematics is good for your mental hygiene. You are going to pay attention to how you prove things, 
you're not going to use excluded middle where you don't have to. You're not going to automatically say in every proof, let's suppose not. Okay? So that, those are good things. They're going to produce better proofs. And it's important what the proofs are like. Thank you. No, everyone has reached the last phase. We can just leave. <laughs> uh, you mean induction on the natural numbers? It's exactly as it was before. In fact, uh, what you would think of as finite combinatorics doesn't change. It changes as soon as you start saying things like for any infinite sequence of finite combinatorial objects, something exists. Then you have to be careful because you're making more complicated things. But the usual stuff like finite arithmetic and um, say finite graphs, that's, there is no basic change there. Uh, one uh, intuitive way of seeing why this is so is because everything is inherently computable. It's about doing, you can implement anything that you, you do that way. Yes. Oh, yes, so, okay, so what Mike is saying is that you have to be a little bit careful because, for example, let's take a typical example. Um, you say, you have a graph, and you say, for every subset of the vertices, something happens. Well, if this graph has seven points, seven vertices, and you say, for every subset, there will be some subsets which are not finite. This doesn't mean that they're infinite. It just means you can't algorithmically tell which of the points these are. So you need to say things like, for every decidable subset, of vertices, which is, so, so, so because there are many more distinctions constructively, you have to then be careful about explaining which distinction, which of the particular variants you have in mind. So there will be some adaptations, but it will be much easier than, say, making analysis work constructively. The difference between constructive mathematics and intuition? Yes, so there is a little bit of unfortunate terminology there. So there is something called Brauerian intuitionism. That's a committed form of constructive mathematics which assumes anti-classical axioms that contradict excluded middle. That was the sort of mathematics that Brouwer did. Then Eric Bishop, uh, he wrote this book, Constructive uh, Analysis, and um, his constructive mathematics is um, conservative, agnostic. It's compatible with classical. Uh, there is something called intuitionistic logic which is more like what Bishop does and less what like Brouwer's intuitionism is. So it's a bit strange. And some people, when they say constructive mathematics, they assume you are uh, also taking in uh, countable choice. So then you have to be careful. So these possibilities of making lots and lots of distinctions are showing up because historically people were steering into different kinds uh, of possibilities. Well, as historically speaking, as far as I know, people who were pursuing constructive mathematics were not pursuing it because of number theory. It was usually a more philosophical reason. Uh, nevertheless, I should point out that very often, having a classical theorem first, even if you're doing constructive mathematics, having first a classical theorem is very, very useful because it's telling you what the possibilities are and then you can try to improve on the theorem, which is certainly what happens in number theory. First you have some crazy proof, then somebody else comes along and makes a better proof, which gives explicit bounds and so on. Uh, now, Gödel's incompleteness phenomena um, hold in constructive mathematics. I, I, I would say that, so there are lots of ways in which you can set things up, but in the large, it, things are going to behave like um, they do classically. 
Sorry? Gather of W. Of the incompleteness theorem? No, Turing's halting problem is completely constructive. Yes. Yeah. And also Gödel's incompleteness. Yeah. What is hard to get constructively is Gödel's completeness theorem, because there you need um, ultra filters, at least the way proofs are set up. Thank you for waiting. <laughs> is uh, mathematics uh, constructed or discovered? Is mathematics constructed or discovered? <laughs> I'm not sure you want to hear my true opinion. Um, I think mathematics as practiced by human beings is an approximation that us forms of made out of carbon and oxygen are trying to get to and is riddled with much more um, social interaction and other forms that we would mathematicians don't want to admit are there than we would like to think. So if you are asking about whether mathematics is discovered and const or, or constructed, I think this is necessarily a question about the community of mathematicians and not about mathematics itself. It is a question about the subject who pursues mathematics. So it's a question for the department over there. I didn't understand the answer. Mathematics is discovered or constructed by people. It is a human activity. So I cannot provide you with a mathematical answer to this question. Ah, now we get questions. <laughs> I would like to make a remark. Yes? That maybe mathematics is constructed by people, but people are not constructed people. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was kind of constructed. 